real quickly, can you help me? We're live in the cafe right now. Can you help me welcome everybody who's sitting out at the cafe right now, too? Great to have you guys with us. Uh, I don't know if you know this about me, but man, I love Christmas. Like, I'm already kind of a positive personality to begin with. I'm like elf without the suit, but like, I love Christmas. And if I love Christmas right now, one of the things I want, like, when I was a kid, like, Christmas was my Super Bowl. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mind when my parents dressed me up in, like, the Christmas outfits and stuff like that. I didn't mind when I was a kid, like, having to put the little red nose on for the, for the uh, uh, Christmas productions at school that... That my parents never came to. Um, they didn't mind any of that. And here's the thing. Here's the one thing that really kind of marked Christmas for me. Like the Charlie Brown Christmas special. When I was a kid, uh, that was like the white flag at a NASCAR event that lets you know that they only have one lap left to go. That's almost like the runner's bell. That was like one lap left to go. This right here helped me understand that Christmas was right around the corner. Like how many of you Gen Xers are with me? Are, are you a Gen Xer? Anybody? Anybody? You know, like, show me, show me, show me how you do that trick. Like, if you just had an emotional experience just then, like, that would make you a Gen Xer. But in order to know when the Charlie Brown Christmas special was coming on Gen Xers, you, you, you remember? Like, you had to buy a newspaper. Like, you had to go look at somebody else's TV guide in order to know when the Charlie Brown Christmas special was coming on. You know why? Because it only came on one day of the year. It was only on one channel at one time. And if you missed it, well, you missed it. And it was almost like Haley's Comet. Like, there goes the Charlie Brown Christmas special. I guess I'll see it again in seven years when it comes back around. Now... I know what some of the Gen Zers are thinking right now, because some of you Gen Zers are like, well, how come you did, just didn't watch it on YouTube? And it's like, there were no computers back then. I mean, wait, wait, I, I take that back. There was one guy that had a computer, and his name was NASA, okay? And I was not him. In fact, the closest thing that I had to a computer was a Teddy Ruxpin. You know, you remember that? It's like a stuffed animal that you put a cassette tape in, but my parents were too cheap to buy me like a real nice one, so I had like a broken one. And so my Teddy Ruxpin at night would be like this, hello, Mark. And it was, it was, it was scary. Like I had nightmares. Like I love Christmas. Part of the reason why I love Christmas is you can eat peppermint bark for lunch and like nobody thinks that's weird. Part of the reason why I love Christmas is I can park my car out in front, in front of somebody else's house at night for like hours at a time and not have them like call the police on me. You know, like I love the Christmas time. But as much as Christmas can be the most wonderful time of the year, this is what we know that Christmas can also be a time where we notice that there are certain things that are missing that shouldn't necessarily be missing. You know, like Christmas should be a time of family and yet sometimes we're like, well, where is my family? Sometimes Christmas should be a time of cheer, and yet sometimes we feel a little bit more cheerless than we feel cheerful. Christmas should be a time where it's a time of giving, and yet sometimes I just realize all the things that I don't have and the things that I wish to have. They, they, you've probably heard me say this before about Christmas, that Christmas is the great multiplier of our emotions, that a lot of times during the Christmas time we experience higher highs and we, experience, we end up experiencing lower lows as a result of that as well. And I, I feel like it's especially during Christmas time that we can be so cognizant of the fact that there's this huge gap in life between what it is that we expected out of life and what it is that I'm experiencing right now. And that gap sometimes feels like a storm. I kind of feel like we're going through a storm. Right now, we're right in the middle of a series called God With Us. And it's based on this verse right here. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23 says this. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means even out in the cafe, I want you guys to say this. Here we go. One, two, three. God with us. Last week, we talked about how God is with us in the wilderness, the wilderness wanderings, those holding patterns and those waiting times of our lives. Next week, we're going to talk about how God is with us in the valleys. And that is that there are times where we do struggle with depression. 
We do struggle with anxiety. That the, that the joy of the Lord isn't necessarily the most prevalent emotion in my life. Sometimes we experience that, unfortunately, during the Christmas time. Today, we're going to be talking about how God is with us in the storms. When we do feel like, you know, the life is raging around us, circumstances aren't necessarily what I want them to be when there is that gap between what I'm experiencing and what I'm expecting. How do I experience God in the middle of that? If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to Acts chapter 27, verses 13. No, Acts chapter 27, verses 19 through 25. Acts chapter 27, verses 19 through 25. And as you're turning there, what I'd love to do is I'd love to give you a little bit of background on the book of Acts. Fascinating. What you'll find is that the book of Acts cannot stand on its own because the book of Acts was written as a two-volume series by a man named Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke. Luke was, it was Luke Acts, and Luke had written um, both uh, chronicles as a way of not only communicating the message of Christianity, but also the impact of Christianity. Not only did he want to talk about the life and the times of Jesus, but he also wanted to talk about the legacy of Jesus. Not only did he want to talk about these followers of Jesus, but he also wanted to talk about how these followers would become then leaders of a movement. And what we know about Dr. Luke from the beginning of Luke is that he sets his purpose extremely plain before us that the reason why he writes both of these volumes to begin with is because he wants to make a meticulous account so that you and I would know what it is that happened during that time. Okay, now here's what you have to understand as we get to Luke chapter 27. There are only 28 chapters in Acts. I mean, not Luke chapter 27, Acts 27. There are only 28 chapters in the book of Acts, so we are nearing the finale. In fact, I would say we are actually at the finale of his two-volume work. Acts chapter 27 is the fulfillment of Paul's greatest ambition. That now what he wants to do is he wants to take the message of Christianity that we Christians call the gospel. That he wants to take the message of Christianity and he wants to take it all the way to the inner chambers of Caesar himself. Here's what he wants to do. He wants to take the tip of the spear and he wants to drive it right into the heart of the most powerful man in the most powerful country in the most powerful city of the world. By the way, fulfilling what it is that Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, 8, where he says that the gospel or the message of Christianity will start in Jerusalem. It'll go to Judea and Samaria and it will go all the way to the ends of the earth. This represents the ends of the earth. But I, I want to say this, that although it represents the end of this book, it only represents the beginning of our work as Christians. Because 2,000 years later, what we find is that there's still people in our world that have not heard the message of the gospel. People in inland China, people in in. in, in in Tibet, people in Northern Africa, people in, uh, people in uh, the Middle East, and our work isn't done. You guys heard me talk about this just a little bit last week, but at the end of every year, we challenge the people of our church to give above and beyond their normal financial gifts in order for to give all that money away, and a third of that money is going to go to us sending, setting up a counseling center in inland China. You know why? because the gospel hasn't gone there yet. And so that's what we're going to do about that. Okay, now, to go on with what it is that we're saying, here's a little map right here that kind of outlines where it is that Paul is going. Paul is sailing from Adramidium, or, or like he's going from Crete, essentially. That's that middle island right there. And now what he's going to do is he's going to sail right into the city of Rome. Okay, now, what I love, what I love, what I love about Acts 27 is this, that about 100 years ago, Perhaps probably the best study of these verses were done by a man named James Smith. And he says this in his book called The Voyage and the Shipwreck of St. Paul. He says this. Talking about the verses we're right about to read in Acts chapter 27. No sailor would have... Oh, by the way, James Smith, he is not only a Bible scholar, but he's also an experienced sailor. And this is what he writes. He writes... 
no sailor would have written in a style so little like that of a sailor. So in other words, what you and I are about to read in Acts chapter 27 sounds nothing like a sailor. You know why? Because there are probably no cuss words in there. Then he goes on to say this, yet no man not a sailor could have written a narrative of a sea voyage so consistent in all its parts unless from actual observation, or would y'all say that with me, or eyewitness. In other words, the Luke, the writer of these two volumes, he's being true to his purpose that he set out to write a meticulous account. Paul is not a sailor. He is out to write a meticulous account of what it is that happened. And even one of the things that we see is that there are 276 men on the ship. You know what I would have said? You know, I'm not good with details. You're pastor. I'm like this. Uh, there's somewhere around 300 people on there. You know, the apostle Paul doesn't do that. He tells us not 275. He tells us 276, which means all that to say, all that to say, you and I can have confidence in this book. Amen. Why don't you all stand up with me? Even in the cafe, why don't you guys all stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word this morning. Acts chapter 27, verse 19 through 25 says this. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their hands. And when neither sun nor star, stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all, would y'all say that word with me, all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, because who wants to eat when they're seasick, right? Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Before you sit down, would you turn to somebody else and say, I have faith in God. Wow, y'all said that so passionately. You're like this, I have faith in God. Did you know that uh, up until recently that we never uh, named hurricanes after people? Do you know that? That we always named hurricanes after places? That it wasn't until 1954 that United States meteorologists started naming hurricanes after their wives and girlfriends. Did you know that? Yeah, it's a true story. So I can always imagine coming home and going, honey, I'm sorry, there's a Category 5 storm. Tons of people are going to die. Lots of, uh, lots of damage. You know what? It kind of reminded me of you. <laughs> we'll name her Hurricane Andrea. It was a lot cheaper than buying you a star, honestly. Okay, let's go to that first verse. Verse 20, it says this right here. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storms continued raging, we finally gave up all, would y'all say it with me, all hope of being saved. Man, I think that is such a powerful term. To get to a place where you have lost all hope, which is what we're experiencing on the morale of this ship, right? That is what the Apostle Paul wants us to know. That is part of the reason why suicide is so incredibly tragic, because it's this whole idea that, you know what, that someone has lost all hope, and they think that somehow that taking their own life is actually going to be a better option than having to go through the storms that stand in front of them. Maybe kind of that's the sentiment that you're feeling right about now. That you've given up, the scripture says, is you've given up all hope of being saved. You've given up all hope that your husband will come to Christmas services. You've given up all hope in having a husband. You've given up all hope that maybe your kids will turn out 
the way that you want them to turn out. You've given up all hope that the diagnosis would change any different from what it is right now. You have given up all hope. And it's like, I, you know, I really don't know what to do. Why don't we go on? The verse says this in verse 21. It says, After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Okay, does anybody want to hit Paul right about now? Because it's almost like this. It's like, hey, everybody, I know that the ship's going down and that we're all afraid that we're going to die. But shh, everybody, apostle, apostle, like word from the Lord right now. Are you ready? I told you so, suckers. And it's like, really? Like we're about to die? This is not helping Paul. And yet what we're going to find from the subsequent verses is that Paul, believe it or not, is trying to discourage, he's not trying to discourage them as much as he's actually trying to encourage them. How do we know that? Why don't we look on in the verse? Because it says this, but now I urge you to keep your courage. Let's, let's pause right there just for a second. Because I think Paul's evangelistic technique is so extremely interesting. Because this is probably maybe what you would expect of your pastor. You'd probably do this to your husband if this were the case. Okay, you're in a Boeing 747 and the plane is going down. You know, you look out the window and it's like, engine two is out. Engine three is out. You know what you would expect me to do? You would expect me to walk up to the front of the plane with my staff and be like, for God, I, lady, I saw how much you drank. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and a... You, you know what's interesting? Paul doesn't do that. What does he do? The plane's going down. Hey, everybody, be encouraged. What does he say? He says this. But I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Don't worry, only the plane's going to be destroyed. Last, because last night an angel of the Lord, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So... Keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. So in other words, Paul is saying, yes, this is your fault. Yes, you should have done things differently. Because maybe some of you CBU students today, you've lost all hope. Because, like, finals are coming, like, next week or something like that. You have procrastinated. You have procrastinated. You pro and next week, you're going to be like, it's spiritual battle. You know, it ain't spiritual battle. You're failing because you didn't study. <laughs> and, you, you, you know, you've, like, lost all hope. Maybe you've lost all hope because everybody in the world told you not to date him. You know, your mama told you not to date him. Your friends told you not to date him. You went to Panda Express one day. You opened up the fortune cookie and it said, I wouldn't date him if I were you. <laughs> and you were like this, but he's got so much potential. Yeah, he does. The potential to ruin your life. And, and, and this is in the situation that Paul and the 276 people, and, and they neglected what weather.com was saying. They were neglecting what the apostle Paul was saying. They were neglecting what everyone was, else was saying, that this is their fault, that they're right in the middle of it, that they're all right about to die. And this, it, it, right in the middle of this, like, it's all your fault moment. This is what the apostle Paul has to say. He says this, so keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God. Okay, here's a principle that I want to talk about today. Here's a principle that even when you've made a mistake with your life, that God is still in control. <sighs> that's what, if you, if you don't know what I'm doing, that's what Koreans do. Either when they've eaten a really, really good Korean barbecue. You thought I was going to say dog, didn't you? 
the Koreans are mad at me for making that joke all the time. They're, they're leaving our church in droves, so I got to make them happy, okay? So Koreans make that noise even when, either when they've eaten a really good Korean barbecue or something. It's like super duper convicting. So I'm going to go ahead and read that again, and I want you to like that. You got to do that with your eyes. You got to tilt your... You gotta do it just like that, even in the cafe, okay? Here we go. Even when you've made a mistake, God is still in control. Here we go. How come you did that louder than I have faith in God? It's weird. I don't know. Okay, all that to say, even if you've screwed up your life by all of your dumb, selfish decisions, guess what? You can still not unscrew your life right out of the will of God. And can I tell you, I don't know how that works. Because you and I are thinking of the exceptions right now. Like, well, what about him? And what about her? I want you to look at your life for a second. You and I have done some dumb things. And yet still right right in the middle of that, somehow, despite all of our selfishness and stupidity, we still have some type of peace. Somehow we're still right in the middle of God's will. And there's a difference between this story and another story that I was thinking about speaking on. And that is Jesus calming the wind and the waves, right? There's a difference between that story and this story. And part of the reason why I wanted to preach on this story is because the difference is this, that in this story, the winds never calm down. In this story, the waves never calm down. In this story, the trouble never ends. And in this story, God does not save them from the shipwreck. However, what I love about this story is this. Your and my peace is not found in the absence of the storm. That your and my peace is found in the presence of God. Can I get an amen to that? That our peace is not found in the absence. Because that's what you and I pray for. God, would you get rid of, and, and would you help me? And would you make sure that, and God says this. That real peace isn't found in the absence of the storm. Real peace is found in the presence of God. In other words, God never promised you that you would never go through a divorce. But God did promise you that in that divorce, I will be with you. God never promised you that you wouldn't have health problems. God just promised you that it's in the middle of all of those treatments that I will be with you every step of the way. God never promised that you would never have to let go of a job or let go of a house during the Christmas time. God just said that's in, that it's in the middle of that that I will end up being with you. Let's look at the next verse because the next verse says this right here. Last night, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. Last night, an angel of the Lord You may not be aware of this, but I believe that there are angels even in this room right now. I believe that there is a world beyond the physical world that I can see, beyond my physical eyes. And I believe that there are angels that, you know, maybe there's an angel that's right beside me right now. I I don't know. All I know is this, that the Bible tells us that in so many different ways that God's presence is with us. That in this part, it tells us that it's an angel that is with us. Sometimes it is the Holy Spirit that is with us. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that means that Jesus himself indwells you. That he goes before you, he goes beside you, he goes behind you, that he's in tomorrow, that he's answering your prayers, that he's healing your hurt, that Jesus goes out with us. And all I know is this, that when I figure out not who I am, but whose I am, all of a sudden, it begins to make a difference in my attitude. Let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. When I was young, when I was a little kid, I was bullied a lot. Does that surprise you? My, my best guess is that in, like, the late 70s, like, Bruce Lee was, like, really big. 
And so all the other kids in my neighborhood would be like, come on, little boy, let's see your kung fu. And, and I, I would, this is not a, this is a true story. I'd be like, I, I don't, I don't know kung fu. I, I play the violin. <laughs> and so, you know, I got beat up all the time when I was a kid. But one day there was this kid that showed up that was transfer student from Laos. Okay, like, I still don't know where Laos is. And he was 10 years old. He had a full-grown beard. Yeah, he was the scariest-looking 10-year-old you had ever seen in your life. Now, my sisters had said uh, it's because he was probably involved with the guerrilla war over there. And I was like, he fought guerrillas? (gasps) He's scarier than I thought. Well, his name was T-Lek. I called him T-Rex. T-Rex became my friend. And it's amazing because when T-Rex became my friend, all of a sudden, you better believe that my attitude changed and my posture changed because all of a sudden he became the muscle and I became the mouth. So I'd like walk around school. I'd be like, you want a piece of this? Huh? You want a piece of this? Yeah, it's kind of funny because where, where did Tom go? Okay, wait, anyway, like, Tom, Tom when, when I'm in the office and it's just me and Monique, I'm like this, yes, Monique, you know? But if, if Tom is beside me, I'm like, you want a piece of this, Monique? Huh? Huh? Why don't you ask that again, Julie Crutchfield? It's, I don't, I don't know where I'm going with this, but, oh, when you know that God is with you, when you, yeah. When you know that God is with you, it changes your attitude. It changes your posture. Because all of a sudden, it's not who, about who I am. It's about, it's about whose I am. Just one, one other quick point, and we'll end, which we really need to. Verse 23 says this, Last night, an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and not only said, Do not be afraid, Paul, but he says this, and I love this so much. Part of the reason why I'm going to keep you alive is because you must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. In other words, Paul, I'm going to let you go down. This isn't your time to go down. Do you know why? Because I need you to fight some battles in the future. That all I want to say is this, that if you're not dead, then you ain't done. And you may feel like you've got a battle that you're going through right now, and there's a storm that you're going through. But let me tell you the reason why you're still alive. It's because you got a greater impact in subsequent days and in subsequent years that God just wants to use you and use you and use you. And if you can just in this moment have more of a long-term perspective than a short-term, wow, this hurts. And what's going to happen is that one day you're going to look back on your life and you're going to have a whole bunch of people surrounded your deathbed. Like, thank you. Thank you for how you served me. You shared with me and how you sacrificed for me. No one else who thanks you will understand the amount of pain that you had to endure to get there. But you will. And God will too. Which bag